And a fine good morning to you this Saturday morning. It's Russ Barkley, back again with your research review. I know, I know, I'm feeling the love, everybody. I really am. Thank you so much for that. Uh, look, today we're going to start with some dad jokes from the Today Show. Also, I'm going to send out a survey to all of you to find out if you still want me to continue with these dad jokes or not. Most people seem to view them favorably, but I do get the occasional request to stop saying them. So um, I'm going to reach out to my subscribers and let's find out what you would like to have. But I'm going to start with some dad jokes today. <laughs> there you go, just in case you don't like them. So let's start with these from today.com. Did you hear the one about the wig thief who escaped from prison? Police are combing the area to find him. Why, of course, what else would they do? I wondered why the baseball was getting closer and closer. And then it hit me. <laughs> That's pretty dumb, I think. Where do surfers go for an education? Surfers go to boarding school. Why, of course. And finally, last up is, did you hear about the guy who was addicted to doing the hokey pokey? He turned himself around. Well, I hope so, for God's sake. That's an old one. All right, <clears throat> let's get on with our five research papers for today. First up is going to be an article that's very exciting. This one's going to be about exploring the relationship of ADHD symptoms to women's orgasmic consistency. Not sure why somebody thought this project up, but I, I guess it's kind of interesting. So let's have a look at what they did. This comes to us, by the way, from the Journal of Sex Research. Of course it is. So this is a study of 815 women, ages 18 and older, who were sexually active and had had at least one partner over the last six months. And they all completed online surveys with regard to ADHD symptoms, as well as their consistency of orgasms. And what they found is that the greater the level of ADHD inattention, the less consistent women reported having orgasms. They also found that those who were on medication had less problems with orga orgasmic consistency, let's get that right, in the women than did those who were off medication. And that's why ADHD symptoms were sort of negatively related to orgasms in that group. So, uh, and then they went on to do some other comparisons that are of less interest here uh, to this channel. But they say that given that women who struggle with difficulties with achieving orgasm are also more likely to have a negative relationship satisfaction, lower self-esteem, and lower sexual satisfaction, they also wonder if this might be related to emotional distress, and this is why this needs to be studied further in women with high levels of ADHD symptoms. Now, I want to emphasize this was not a study of clinic-referred individuals. It's just a population study in which they're looking at relationships of ADHD symptoms to these other variables. All right, my next study comes to us from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, and it's a study of the relationship between being physically active and degree of suicidal ideation in teens with ADHD. Now, we're not talking here about physical exercise. I want to be clear about that. What we're looking at here is levels of daily physical activity, and in this study, they looked at 60 adolescents with ADHD and they had them wear a special activity monitoring device each day so that they could track levels of physical activity. And then they looked at the relationship of that activity to the extent to which they reported suicidal thinking. The authors also took measures of depression, anxiety, and resilience and stress. And what they found when they put all of these variables into their analyses is that the degree of daily physical activity, particularly if it was of moderate or vigorous extent, was negatively predictive of suicidal things. So the more active the individuals were, the less likely they were to be reported reporting suicidal thinking. And by the way, suicidal ideation is highest in adolescents to young adults across the lifespan. So yeah, I can see why they concentrated on this age group of 12 to 17 year olds. 
Now, having found that relationship, they also explored it further and found that it was really mediated by the degree of depression and, to a lesser extent, anxiety and resilience, meaning that those who were physically active <clears throat> also were less depressed, and it was depression that mediates the link to suicidal thinking. Now, I found that years ago in my longitudinal study of ADHD kids followed to adulthood, where depression was most predictive of who was thinking of suicide, but degree of impulsiveness in their ADHD symptoms was most predictive of suicide attempts. So it's really the combination of depression with impulsivity that is most likely to lead to actual attempts. And by the way, the attempts they made were worse and often resulted in hospitalization if they had not been successful at the suicide gesture itself. So uh, all of this makes perfect sense. And here's another study confirming that while degree of activity is related to suicidal thinking, it's really related more to depression and then depression links to suicidal ideation. Okay, next up is an interesting paper over at Sleep Medicine. This comes to us from two very good friends of mine, and that is Laura Naus and Steve Becker. And by the way, Laura is not only the chair of psychology here at the University of Richmond, she's also my daughter-in-law, I'm proud to say. And Steve's been a good friend of mine for quite some time and also a fellow colleague studying the other attention disorder, cognitive disengagement syndrome. If you're not familiar with that, please have a look at my videos on this channel that explains this other attention disorder, which often gets misdiagnosed as ADHD inattentive type. <clears throat> now, what did Laura and Steve do? They did a study in which they surveyed um, individuals with, uh, excuse me, 106 adults ages 18 to 75, let's get that right, and they surveyed them with self-assessments of both ADHD symptoms, cognitive disengagement syndrome symptoms, sleep quality and functioning, and circadian preference, meaning what hours of the day did they most prefer and found themselves to be more alert and attentive and active. So we're looking here then at the relationship of ADHD, CDS, to sleep problems and circadian preference. Now, what did they find? They found that both dimensions of ADHD symptoms, the inattention and the hyperactive impulsive symptoms, as well as CDS symptoms, were all related uniquely to sleeping difficulties. So each was related to a different kind of sleep problem. They found, however, that only ADHD inattention symptoms were uniquely associated with more frequent sleep medication use. So those are the individuals most likely to try to take something, uh, some medication to help with sleep. They found that hyperactive impulsive symptoms, in contrast, were uniquely related to sleep duration and especially shorter sleep duration, also related to more global ratings of sleep impairment. Now, interestingly enough, they found that CDS symptoms <clears throat> were uniquely associated with poor sleep quality, longer onset to sleep, greater daytime dysfunction, and even greater global sleep impairment. They also showed a preference, that is an evening preference, in their circadian rhythm. So the authors conclude that CDS has a greater relationship to a variety of sleeping problems than does ADHD, even though ADHD symptoms also predict certain kinds of sleeping difficulties. In other words, both attention disorders are uniquely impacting the quality of sleep and the degree of sleeping difficulties in this population of individuals. Now, again, I do want to emphasize these were not clinically diagnosed individuals with ADHD. Again, we're looking at a population study and correlations of levels of symptoms with various problems. Now, my fourth study is from Clinical Neurophysiology, and it's a study of EEG, functional connectivity, in medication-naive children 
with ADHD. So all of the individuals in this study <clears throat> underwent an EEG evaluation. There were 74 children and 33 of them were kids with ADHD who had not been medicated. And the other 41 were typically developing children. And using certain kinds of machine learning as applied to the results of the EEG, they were able to look at connectivity across the brain using this electrical activity uh, in people with ADHD versus, or children with ADHD versus the typical children. And what they found overall, and not surprising, this has been seen repeatedly in research going back for more than 50 years. They found that there was decreased beta activity over the frontal regions and that it was very poorly or hypo-connected. Now, beta activity is associated with concentration and attention. So no surprise that the kids with ADHD had much lower levels of this beta band activity and that it was poorly connected across regions of the frontal lobe. They also found, consistent with earlier study, that there was increased theta activity in the posterior parts of the brain. Theta activity is associated with low levels of arousal, mind wandering, daydreaming, in other words, lack of concentration. And they found that this was hyper connected in the posterior parietal and central networks. By the way, those posterior networks are associated with the default mode network of the brain. And you know from my previous discussions of cognitive disengagement syndrome, that other attention disorder, that the default mode network seems to be specifically associated with CDS even more than it is with ADHD. So we're beginning to see here some hyperconnectivity in posterior parts of the brain may be involving that default mode network and low levels of frontal activity associated with concentration. The authors hope that perhaps someday this kind of machine learning applied to EEG might be of some help in diagnosing ADHD, but we're not yet ready for that at this time. My last study for you on this Saturday is a review of ADHD and sex hormones in females, in women. And it's a systematic review that was published over in the Journal of Attention Disorders. And in this review, the authors were able to identify 11 different studies on the issue of hormones and ADHD symptoms in women. And they conclude that the evidence was largely suggestive that there is a relationship between these ADHD symptoms and sex hormones in females, not only in puberty, but also across the menstrual cycle. And a few studies even find it across the lifespan, particularly during perimenopause as well. So although the findings are limited because of the small number of studies, the findings are pretty consistent in showing that there is some kind of relationship here that women with ADHD have been talking about for a long time, but that science has been very slow out of the gate to study. And I hope that that's now being corrected by this increasing number of studies and reviews like this as well. Well, all right, everybody, thanks for joining me on this Saturday. I really appreciate your paying attention to these research reviews, but especially being a subscriber to this channel. And as always, when I conclude these reviews and my other videos, I wish you to live well, be well, take care, and bye for now, everybody.